check out ESPN Films' newly released 30 for 30 podcast. From the producers of our award-winning documentary series, this is an amazing collection of sports stories you need to hear to believe. Speaking of amazing, Delta Airlines and the Fly Delta app make your travel experience amazingly easy with real-time bag tracking, e-boarding, and passport scanning during check-in. And don't forget to download 30 for 30 podcasts to fill your flight with stories that will keep you coming back for more. And blaming Katy Perry, does that make you officially team Taylor Swift, or did you just break down the track and comparison there? I don't think there's any comparison. Thank you, Baker. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Baker Mayfield wins big games, wins press conferences. Just hand that young man the Heisman right now. But Baker better not act like he wouldn't be quick to call Katy Perry back. You know what I'm saying? If she shouted him out <laughs> on game day. What's good? Welcome to the best 60 minutes of your day. Later, we check in with the head coach of the fourth-ranked Penn State Nittany Lions, James Franklin. Plus, we discuss whether a certain line is too concerned with the opinions of sheep and whether once and for all, People will quit trying to put Tom Brady out to pasture. But first, here are the stories we put into our A block of the six, which we like to call the six at six, starting with the status of number 13. Yeah, that's a big deal around these parts, that's for sure. Monday night game, all eyes are on Odell as we gear up for kickoff of Lions-Giants tonight. So let's head out to Lisa Salters for the latest. Hello, Michael. Hello, Jamel. Well, Odell Beckham seemed confident when we met with him on Saturday that he would be able to go tonight, even though he told us he's not 100 percent. But we will not have that official word until about 7 o'clock, and I'll be back on SportsCenter with that update. Last season, Beckham accounted for 26 percent of the Giants' offensive yards, the highest rate for any NFL wide receiver in 2016. And it was obvious how much they missed their star wide receiver last week in the 19-3 loss to Dallas. If Beckham does play tonight... He told us he'd likely do something he has never done before, and that's tape up his ankles for support. Until now, he said he just hasn't been a fan of taping up, but in this case, he said it just makes sense. But though we're still waiting for word on OBJ, we know for sure that Giants middle linebacker B.J. Goodson is out tonight because of a lower leg injury, and that's a blow to Big Blue because Goodson was one of the few bright spots last week. He had a league-high 18 tackles in his first NFL start. Goodson will likely be replaced by undrafted rookie Calvin Munson out of San Diego State. He played on special teams in week one, but didn't get a single defensive snap. All right, thank you, Lisa. Now, we know Matthew Stafford will suit up because that's what he does. Tonight will mark his 101st consecutive start. His first as the NFL's highest paid player went rather well, four touchdowns, 70 percent, and most important, a win over Arizona. Yeah, he threw that pick six, but whatever. <laughs> but if he's ever going to win over his critics, he ultimately has to win in the postseason. At the very least, he has to beat good teams. The people who would rather watch his pockets and actually watch him love to cite stats such as this. Why I'm sure you'll hear that? this one at some point during the broadcast tonight that Stafford's 5-43 and 43 against teams that finish with a winning record. 1-23 and 23 against such teams on the road. There it is. For purposes of this matchup against the Giants tonight, as you just saw a second ago, Stafford's lines are 3-14 and 14 on the road against teams that made the playoffs the previous season. And since 2011 with Stafford under center, Detroit is 3-11 in prime time, which why tonight is a showcase game. The topic of conversation tomorrow will be about that man, Matthew Stafford, continuing to show what a premier passer he is, okay, and why he is justified in having the deep pockets. People like you who have historically liked to trash him won't respect the fact that he's had not, not had much of a running game or much of a defense, but he's a good player, and I'm telling you, he shows it tonight against a really good defense on the road. I know it's not the playoffs, but he's going into Eli's house, mm -hmm. and he's going to show you why you ought to be quiet when it comes to the broke Jay Cutler <laughs> stuff that you like to say about I him. I hope for your sake you're right. I know I'm right. I know what he's going to do tonight against okay. a really good defense. And people like you will try to qualify it and try to minimize it and say, so what? It's not the playoffs. Show me what happens in the postseason. We don't know that the Giants will finish with a winning record or not, right? That's what you're going to say tomorrow, mm. no matter what he does? I give credit where it's due. I'm fair. No, <laughs> I am fair. And, 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 look, I never said that all the losses uh, in those records that you pointed out about how he's performed on the road, how uh, the Lions have performed against teams who finished with a winning record, it wasn't all on Matt Stafford. I mean, as it is, as it's never on all of any quarterback. Mm -hmm. That's just the way right. it is. I hate records. However, that being said – there is a difference between 
having those records and it not always be your fault, but you not necessarily being someone that can help them give up, get over that hump. Because that is what that $200 million is, is, is worth. No, actually, it's what about is, What it's for. It's about timing. It's about timing, too. Exactly. Yes, I mean, There's a lot a, of teams that would love to have look, Matthew when you, Stafford. When you make a big paycheck, the obligations are going to be bigger. And while certainly the Lions have been a case study in organizational dysfunction, mm-hmm. again, which preceded Matt Stafford, Correct. I realize that. But in some ways... The fact that they have paid him this much money over the course of his career and have very little to show for it is indicative of of who the Lions are. But not who he is necessarily. He just gets a bad rap. He gets looked at as a bonus baby. He was lucky to be born in a time where number one overall picks were getting those ridiculous signing bonuses. He was born in a time where there's a a lack of of quality quarterbacks, and that's all he is. Just somebody basically at the Lions are saying, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with. I love Matthew Stafford if it's not clear to you. He's a a tough quarterback, a a gritty quarterback, makes all the throws, and is better than that record would indicate. And that's what I'm saying. Like, look look at the, the things he's had to overcome. The things he had to deal with, the organizational failures that you talked about. And again, it's not the postseason, but a primetime game against a quality defense. All I want to see is people give him the respect he deserves tomorrow well, to after he balls that out respect, tonight. Though, Mike, because he should have earned it by now. There, there, Mike, you can't have the record that he has and, and automatically everybody's just supposed to buy in. Like, I'm not saying he's Tom Brady, but that makes for a lot of people. Most people aren't Brady. Most people aren't Brady. Most people aren't Ben. Tom Brady, what I am saying is your, rec- your paycheck can't look like that and your record on the road and against good teams can't look like that either. Sorry. Tell you something. My paycheck could look like that. Now don't, <laughs> <laughs> that's another conversation. Uh, uh, before we get into the Cowboys' performance on the field, here's an update on Ezekiel Elliott's legal situation. U.S. District Judge Amos Mazant denied the NFL's motion for an emergency stay of the injunction that has allowed Elliott to play as he fights for his suspension for domestic violence. Uh, the case now moves to the fifth, the fifth U.S. District Court of Appeals in New Orleans, where the NFL already has filed an appeal. Most anticipate the legal wrangling between the league and Elliott means he will almost certainly play all of this season. So there's that. Now on the field, Ezekiel Elliott, he had his worst day as a professional on a lot of fronts, <laughs> right? And nine carries for eight yards in Denver's thorough 42-17 beatdown. Also, not running back when it came to an under- interception. Here's Jason Garrett on that today. One of the things that we preach to our team on both sides of the ball when there's a turnover, everybody's involved. Uh, if you're an offensive player, you become a defensive player on a fumble or an interception. And, uh, you know, Zeke is one of the most natural competitors I've ever been around. He loves to play. He loves to practice. And I think we've seen that through his first year playing. And those two players are not indicative of, of the kind of competitor that he was. And we have to get that addressed. Every time, every time I see this play, it makes me sick. It really does. Because, see, anybody can front run. Mm-hmm. Anybody can do this when you're gaining yards and that old line is, is opening holes for you, making room for you to lead the league in rushing and get 80 yards in every professional game. Anybody can do that. It takes a real competitor, and, and, and don't tell me he's a competitor. Show me he's a competitor. When things aren't going well, that's just still hustling. So if I'm Jason Garrett, I'm not talking to Ezekiel Elliott today. I'm going to show him one play. We have that play, roll it. This is Benjamin Watson, then of the New England Patriots, from the year 2000. And six, 2005 season, 2006 playoffs. See, this is, a, this is not the best angle because you don't get the full appreciation. You don't get the full appreciation. That's not the angle I needed. The angle I need, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what it is in case you've never seen it. The angle I need to see is not that, but when Champ Bailey picked off Tom Brady, Benjamin Watson came from across the field, on the other side of the field, mm-hmm. completely across the field, and knocked Champ Bailey out of bounds before he scored. Okay, best hustle play I've seen in a long time, if not ever, when it comes to being out of the play and never giving up on a play. That's not to say that Ezekiel Elliott could have done anything in that situation. And it wasn't a pick six anyway in that situation. But if you want to truly be the face of 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 a franchise, one of the faces of this league, you have got to do the right things when everybody's not looking, because that eye in the sky never lies. Yeah, because coaches always talk about uh, how a lot of times in blowouts and in situations like Dallas that they were in, they were often look at the film to see who's trying, who Mm -hmm. gave up. And it's partly why I believe it was LaDainian Tomlinson who said that Ezekiel Elliott quit on his team yesterday, which is a heavy indictment for any player and should be considered an embarrassment that people would even think that you would. You're listening to Love Advice with Leanne. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, Hi, Leanne. Long-time listener, first-time caller. (laughs) Why, in your professional opinion, do you never take my calls off the air? Is this Carl? Yep, it's Carl. I mean, we had a few dates. Everything was great, I thought. uh... Well, you know... 
When you switch to GEICO, you could save a lot of money on car insurance. Okay, awesome. You should call them. I will. GEICO, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. All right, there is Odell Beckham Jr. warming up. Maybe he'll play in tonight's Lions-Giants game. We're still awaiting word to find out. But if it means anything to you, Adam Schefter said (laughs) he looked like somebody (laughs) who might be preparing to play. But I did read (laughs) other reports that Ben McAdoo is out on the field and watching him very closely. But... We also watched that stretch last week, though. I exactly. Mean, the and exact same and stretch. You know, Ryan, <laughs> yes, like, see many a warm up in your day. Routine, right. What did you take from that? Yeah, yeah, that Does that look like? That looked like a guy that's just stretching. You know what I mean? <laughs> they got some, we didn't show it in fairness. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, Lisa Salters told us earlier that uh, if he does play, he will have his ankles taped for the first time mm-hmm. in his uh, career. But regardless, I mean, we saw what the Giants' offense looked like without him. Right. So even if he's not fully 100%, Ryan, do you feel like, uh, as I think you put it, Mike, a piece of Odell is better than no Odell. Absolutely. Jr. Absolutely. All. Because a, a piece of Odell makes me more nervous than the whole of everybody else they have on their team. The, the what ifs, right? The, the way you got to call defenses if, if, if you're a defensive coordinator just because he's out there. Mm-hmm. And if he's going to go, because I watched some of the stuff from last week and he looked pretty good in warm ups. And if he's going to go, I'm sure he's going to make sure he can be. Uh, successful out there, and he can contribute. Look at and that. so, and I mean, so, if he got, can, you're not the t- sorry to cut you off. You're not the yeah. team doctor, or and obviously they have to make the final decision. But does does that tell you anything? You know, him him sprinting that way. Or? Well, you know, he kind of he kind of moved like that last week. I think it was just some certain moves in and out of cuts, jumping up, trying to you know gather yourself when you get the ground, decelerate some things he wanted to to make sure he can do. And he'll be if he goes, that means he's going to think he can play well. That he can play well. Yeah, that he can play well. He, yeah, he, yeah, yeah. He's not like I'm just gonna be out here. Okay. Gotcha. Like if you know him, like dudes with blonde hair don't want to just be there. <laughs> they want their attention. You know what I'm saying? They want. They want to put. Yeah, on like, the like you don't feel you on that. There, you know, like, analysis. Talking about those. Analysis. Talking about those. Did, did anybody that was going to a salon and say, "I'm gonna get blonde hair" because I really just want to blend in? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Am I right or wrong? <laughs> There's some fairness. Hey, man. <laughs> Best thing you said in a long time. And that's saying something. That's saying something. But my concern, though, Ryan, is that especially if, with a high ankle injury, you yes. know the nature of those. They yes. linger, and you're never quite right. And, I, look, I, everybody saw that horror show that was their offense, and I was right. just as surprised as anybody that nobody else seemed to be able to do anything. They have an offensive line that's shaky at best. They got a great defense. For whatever reason, Eli Manning and, and Brandon Marshall don't look like they're on the same page right. necessarily. Maybe some of that just comes with time. But when you look at their schedule, especially the next three weeks, if he doesn't play tonight, this could get out of hand for them real bad. Yeah, well, you, d- you definitely don't want that to be the pressure that makes him play. Right. Right. You want to make sure he's able to protect himself, not only from the ankle injury, but from other injury right. if he's out there. And, and, and I'm sure they will be smart with him because he's the future. Right, he's the best player on that team, and it's not close. Real quick, obviously everybody's body is different. He said this was a six to eight week, eight week injury. Have you ever heard of somebody coming back for, in four weeks from a six to eight week? You know, um, immediately when I sat down, I thought T.O. Super Bowl. You know, which, which leg. yeah, yep. which is an injury uh, actually much like this because a lot of times they say when you get a high ankle sprain, it's better to break it mm-hmm. or have a fracture in it. You know, so you can come back, and there are some special individuals in the world. I wasn't one of them. <laughs> you know, like I, I would go out there and limp just because I was tough and stupid. <laughs> you know what I mean? But there are some people who can come back and actually play well, and maybe Odell is one of those people. All right, so to recap, Adam Schefter says that looks like somebody getting ready to play. <laughs> Ryan Clark said, look at him. Right. All you got to do is look at he his head running. and know <laughs> that the lights are on, so he ready to Ready to play. All right, Appreciate thank you, Ryan. You. Right, Appreciate well, now you have blonde. Uh, <laughs> I want to blend in. <laughs> Some college football. Penn State up to number four in passing USC in the latest AP poll after the Nittany Lions' second shutout win of the season. That only serves to sweeten the storyline for Saturday night when Iowa and Penn State meet in their Big Ten opener. Iowa, in case you didn't know, has won each of its last three home games against top five opponents, including that last second win over third-ranked Penn State in 2008. Overall, the Hawkeyes have knocked off four AP Top 5 teams in the last 10 years. And joining us now to talk about the Big Ten opener, Penn State coach James Franklin. Now, Coach, we're going to get to that Iowa matchup in a second. But let's rewind a little bit and go back to Saturday. You were up 56 to nothing on Georgia State. You took a timeout, and to a lot of people, it looked like you were icer kicking, icing kicker Brandon Wright. It worked because he missed it. You can tell us, I thought it was boss. I hope you were trying to ice him. Keep it real. 
Did you try to ice him to pre- preserve the shutout? Uh, no, actually, you know, I, I've been doing this for 23 years. I've never <laughs> worked a fourth. A fourth. We had our fourth team in the game at the time, and we've never worked a fourth team field goal block. So we called timeout to send our second team field goal block on the field to block it. Um, you know, we, we play to a standard here. I don't care what the score is. I don't care what the situation is. We're going to try to block the field goal. We're not just going to, you know, give up points or give up a play. So we called the timeout to go block the field goal. There's no doubt about that. Well, see, Coach, uh, the reason why, you know, we thought you might have been icing the kicker to preserve that shutout is because last week you trolled Pitt by saying <laughs> it was just like beating Akron, which I'm sure went over well with your fans. So we figured, Jay, you were on a mission this year to make a statement. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, the people that follow us know that I say that every single week. But when you take a small section of the uh, press conference and right. put it out nationally, it has a completely different context. But you know that that's that's how it is. I, I live with it. The most important thing for me is to get our team ready to play. And the people that follow us week in, week in and week out, listen to all my press conferences. I say that every single week, so uh, it, it is what it is. But but I'm comfortable with what we're doing here at Penn State. You should be 127 uh, to nothing with a couple of uh, those those two shutouts. Anyway, uh, so I want to talk about a guy. Speaking of getting ready to play, Saquon Barkley, um, 12 to one odds right now to win the Heisman, fifth best in the country, but the best of any nine QB. We can see how special he is on Saturday. What makes him special uh, the rest of the week behind the scenes? You know, he, he's been an awesome kid, really, kind of throughout the whole process, through the recruiting process, from the day he showed up on campus, everything we've asked him to do academically, athletically, socially, the whole package, uh, he's done it. He's the guy that we got to drag out of the stadium after the game, sign an autograph. Uh, he's handled all this success uh, so, so well, better than any kid his age I've ever been around. Hmm. I would have never been able to handle all the all the attention he's been able to get. Um, and he's just he's just been tremendous. He's you know when your best player is your hardest working guy on your team, it kind of sends a message for the whole organization. All right, let's talk about the matchup uh, this weekend. As I mentioned, Iowa is three and zero against top five teams at home in the last ten season. So what's the most important thing you hope to drive home to your players this week about that game? Well, first of all, I, I want to thank you uh, for agreeing to wear blue during the Michigan State-Penn State game this year. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not going to get me. No, that's not, not going to happen. Right? That's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, you know, I obviously got so much respect for Iowa and Coach Ferentz and their program. Um, you know, you, you look at over the last 10 games, you know, Penn State versus Iowa, you know, they, they have a winning record against us. You know, we're obviously going to their venue. It's a night game. It's a stripe out from what I understand. Last year, I remember watching a night game at their place when, when they were able to beat Michigan, when Michigan was ranked pretty highly. So, you know, we know we're up for a tremendous battle. You know, they have one of the more consistent programs in the country built up front with their O-line and D-line. Uh, they got a special running back, you know, so this is going to be a real challenge. It's our first game on the road. And, um, you know, I, I know we're going to work all week long like crazy to make sure our guys are prepared to go compete. All right, we want to end this on a lighthearted note real quick. A friend of mine was actually at your game on Saturday, and he couldn't help but notice the fun environment, the fact that you're playing a lot of Meek Mill and Lil Uzi uh, during the games. Uh, you know, despite the fact that there's a lot of stakes, a lot of things at stake rather this season for your team, and you're in the thick of a national championship hunt, uh, how do you sort of maintain that sense of fun and create that kind of environment? Well, I think ultimately this is a game, and I think you know a lot of coaches and a lot of programs take themselves way too serious. And I, I want our guys to work hard, but I think one one really important lesson to learn in life is you know if if you can have fun while you're working hard, you're going to do the you're going to do the work anyway. You're going to come to you know come to work, or you're going to come to practice, and you're going to have to do these you know these duties. So we might as well have fun while we're doing it. And then when we want to play on Saturday night. I want them to be loose. I want them to be confident. I want the stadium rocking. We had 102,000 at the game last week. We had 109,000 the week before. It's a big party. I got all my friends, all my family, 109 of my closest friends and relatives in the stadium. <laughs> and we're going to party and have a good time. All right. Always a good time talking Definitely. to you. Definitely. And Thank playlist you. suggestion. Rake it up. <laughs> there nice you go. Nice. <laughs> Thanks, Coach. Good luck against Iowa. We appreciate you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you. All right. Uh, Peep my man, Ohio safety, Javon Hagan. 
That's great. <laughs> he just snatched your towels. That's like me with pens. Don't leave your pen around me. Hey, well, is he building like a trophy case? Is that what he's doing? And by the way, that wasn't his first time doing it. He did it before it's last the little year, thing. too. It's the little thing. I love it. You never know. They may drop a pass because their hands are slippery. You never know. We're going to start DTM with my favorite clip from the, the weekend. Here is Teddy Atlas losing it after the Canelo Triple G fight was ruled a draw. There's no oversight board in boxing. There's no commission. There's no national commission. No federal guidelines. Nobody looking and saying, ah, can't do that. Ah, can't do that. The fact of the matter is, with this judge, you eliminate this person. You make sure Judge Bird, the official Bird, is not around. Again. She will be working again. I make you a bet. I love you. I make you a bet. Okay. Damn I'm saying what this sport is doing to that man. Uh, a lot of people are like, it's just bad for boxing. It can't be good or bad for boxing when it is boxing. Right. This is the essence of boxing. Corruption, controversy. We got what we wanted. We got a great fight. It's a great Probably fight. gonna get a rematch. There was some one of the judges scored a draw. Another one had it close. The outlier obviously was 118 to 110. Thankfully that judge is gonna sit the next couple of plays out, Chief. But it is what it is when it comes to this sport, right? It, it is. I mean, it's... Why is, that, why is boxing always on trial? It's, it's a stereotype of what it is, but it doesn't impact interest because I would watch this fight again. Be- they did a rematch. In part because, because of the controversy. Because of the controversy and because it was just a great fight. Mm-hmm. It lived up to all the hype. I had it for Triple G, though. How about you? Uh, I did, too. Yeah. yeah. Mike Zimmer came out today and said Sam Bradford is day-to-day with a left knee injury. Yesterday, he was even less specific and a lot more facetious. He's going to be okay, okay? Sam will be the quarterback. He's going to be okay. Next week? Maybe. Maybe the next week. Maybe six weeks from now, he's going to be okay. You got to understand your audience, <laughs> man. You <laughs> talking from a walkie-talkie? No, I mean, but... 2 four, niner? Like, I what mean, is he talking about? But you say this, everybody's... Look at how your offense look without Sam Bradford. Look at how you look week one, and look at Sam Bradford's track record. So you can't just throw out there all willy-nilly, like, maybe six weeks, we're going to take it literally. Right. Thankfully... <laughs> Supposed to be a bone bruise, I think is what they said. Yeah, just unfortunate timing for them. All right, a week after getting his potential game time field goal blocked in the loss to the Broncos Chargers rookie kicker Young Ho Koo missed a 44 yard field goal with five seconds left in the loss to the Dolphins. Uh, Anthony Lynn, though, said he's still sticking with Koo. <laughs> uh, Chargers charged, huh? Yeah, uh, by the way, speaking of the Chargers, uh, El Pollo Grill in San Diego, they're giving away free tacos every day after the Chargers. I lose. love this idea. I love it's it. It's great. Like, they, there's they, got to be some kind of They're going to give away a lot of, lot of tacos, that's Taco for sure. Tuesday, I, I'm in for that. I mean, you know, why, why you got to be miserable all the way around? Why you get something for your trouble. Get out of their own way. Golly. So, Marshawn Lynch. Marshawn Good old Lynch. time. Exactly. <laughs> the Raiders were blowing out the Jets. After the game, some of the Jets said they were, you know, upset about it. Jordan Jenkins said it was infuriating and embarrassing. But he wasn't talking about, like, oh, like he was showing them up. And some at ESPN, some of our social accounts, took him out of context. So rightfully so, he took us to task. Trust me, we've been victims of that. Anyway, I'm glad he clarified it because it's one thing to be sorry, don't be soft. Like, the only reason he's dancing is because he's beating up on you. Because they were clowning y'all. Exactly. So you want to stop him from dancing, stop him from scoring. Exactly. And let's quote people accurately, shall we? Uh, Jags fans, they thought it would be a good idea to jump into a tub of mayo. In the heat. In the, right. That's just disgusting, right? Meanwhile, you already know who rules the tailgates. Bill's Mafia. <laughs> they say, hold my beer. Jags fans, y'all don't know about this life. So wait, y'all. what are the Bills fans? I see the Jags fans. What are the Bills the fans? The Bills fans, they Bills fans. Look at that. Hating tables everywhere, but this table fought back. They fought a table and the table won. I got to go with the Jags in this one, though. You go with the mail? Remember last week when the Jags were, like, on the come up? <laughs> what happened? <laughs> what happened, right? <laughs> I'm going to tell you what's going to come up. It's group celebrations. Better celebrations. Steelers or Falcons? I'm going with the rolling of the dice. That's a good one. Shake them up, shake them up, shake them up, shake them. It's good, but I'm going with the rolling of the no, dice. No, the dice was that was. They special. both went hard in the paint. That was special. All right, before we call it a day, tell the people had a good day. Oh, it's a good day for Sarah Kustak. She is moving from sideline reporter to Yes's primary game analyst. Only woman to work as the primary solo NBA game analyst at a regional sports network. So congratulations to her. Good day for Cleveland. Browns, one and a half point road favorite at Indy. First time the Browns have been favored since 2015. Baby progress, steps. people. Progress. Baby steps. Meanwhile, Colts have given all-time franchise 
SAC leader Robert Mathis the title of pass rush consultant. And that's the first and last time we're probably going to discuss this game. Just being honest. <laughs> All right. Being honest. Undefeated in the preseason, now your favorite. Browns. A little ball moving little up in the world. A lot of toughness, though. All right, that's it for us. More sports on this next. Enjoy Monday Night Football with Odell Beckham. We'll see you tomorrow. Check out ESPN Films' newly released 30 for 30 podcast. From the producers of our award-winning documentary series, this is an amazing collection of sports stories you need to hear to believe. Speaking of amazing, Delta Airlines and the Fly Delta app make your travel experience amazingly easy with real-time bag tracking, e-boarding, and passport scanning during check-in. And don't forget to download 30 for 30 podcasts to fill your flight with stories that will keep you coming back for more. Six at six starts at the top of the fifth. See what I did there? Uh, Cubs looking. Hi, Mike. Hey, everybody. They're fourth straight. And John Lackey certainly thought he called Carlos Martinez looking. Uh, Martinez, if you notice, even he started walking toward, uh-huh. the, toward the dugout. And upon further review, home plate umpire Joy Baker said, eh, missed this one. God, I hate it. You know, I know, right? Job's hard enough. I don't need you to make my job harder. all watered up. See? And what happens next? You knew it. Shoot. RBI base hit, Martinez makes it two to one. Now check out Lackey's reaction. That's called multitasking. On this he's covering, but he's, he's letting him know. I wouldn't be if it wasn't for you. And he goes right for the right for the plate, jaws at the ump. Certainly not lacking any emotions. Anyway, he gets. I about had it with you. He gets casually tossed. Wilson Contreras is going to be right behind him. Got his money's worth. Sure did. Might be a suspension for Contreras. All right, what's good? What's really good? Welcome to the best 60 minutes of your day. Feel good Friday edition. Haven't been this thankful for a Friday in a minute. I have no idea why. What could I know? <laughs> this weekend sports slate is lit. We're a day away from Lamar Jackson and the Cardinals taking on Clemson. Coming up, we'll take you out to Louisville. Who's going to be the king in the ring tomorrow night? Later, Teddy Atlas helps us preview Canelo Triple G. And what's it going to take to dethrone the king? What's going on in the Queen City? Tell you what, everything continues to go right in Cleveland. And we now go to part-time Cleveland resident Pedro <laughs> Gomez, who can't go home until Cleveland loses. <laughs> now, Pedro, there's been a playoff-like atmosphere that's been building around the team. How are they managing that during this streak? You know what? They are absolutely wrapping their arms around this because they do have some younger players that weren't on the roster last year for the World Series. So therefore, what they're getting right now is really an indoctrination into what October is like. And really, this roster is being engulfed by what's going on here. It's not October, but it kind of feels like it. Um, There's there's more media because our media base is a little bit more quiet right now. We have more media. Also, the fans are loud, it's sellouts, and every game matters. You know, September every every, in September every game matters uh, because there's a lot of people, a lot of teams are in it, and it's just something special. We still have a lot of it's a lot at stake. You know what I mean? It's one of those deals where. You know, we have an opportunity to still catch the Dodgers. You know, we're a couple games up on the Astros, and we have to play well because I think home field advantage is very important. And look, I have been in this stadium for the World Series in 1995, 1997, and last season. I can tell you that when Francisco Lindor hit that double with two strikes and two outs in the bottom of the ninth yesterday, this place reacted just like it has during those World Series games where big moments took place. And as another side note, guys, Trevor Bauer takes the mound for the Indians tonight, and all he's done is win nine consecutive decisions. All right, Pedro, thank you so much for that rather appropriate report because, you know, I am so sick and tired of hearing people say, and I heard it a lot today, you've heard it a lot lately, that, oh, you know, that's way too much winning too soon. As they get into October. Like it's a bad thing. And like it's a bad thing. Oh, they need to lose. That implies that this is luck. Right. This is about a really good team that actually could be better. This isn't fluky. 
This is about skill. This is about depth. And I love that they're being prepared for October. See, that's how you take this story and make it and, and own it, as opposed to like, oh, we're, we're peaking too early. No, we're preparing ourselves for October. I love that. Yeah, I'd love that, too. And ask yourself right now, would you rather be the Dodgers or the Indians? You know what I mean? And the Dodgers are on the other side of this. I mean, I think that goes without saying. Look, I know a lot of people don't believe in momentum. And it can be kind of a, a tricky thing. But I would much rather be going into the postseason with this playing kind of baseball. with this kind of momentum, playing great baseball, as you said, and with all this confidence. So let me ask you something. When we come back here Monday, will they still be streaking? Yes. We're not about to be party poopers, right? No. They will get 25. They got three more at home against the Royals. They've beaten the Royals six times this year. The Royals haven't won at Progressive since May 27th. These fools have forgotten how to win. <laughs> They're having so much fun. And like I said, this is not fluky at all. They're that focused. I feel like they must have a poster or a cutout cardboard of an owner in their locker room. All right. <laughs> and you're the first team since 1939 to start a season with two home games and not a single offensive touchdown. When you make that kind of dubious history, your offensive coordinator is probably history. Bengals fired O.C. Ken Zampezi, replaced him with Bill Lazor today, marking the first time in the franchise's 50-year history that they fired a coordinator during the season. Quick trigger, but is it a quick fix? It's a quick trigger. I don't know if this will fix everything because when you look at how the Bengals, how bad, like they, they've been playing the first two weeks of the season, we had uh, Teddy Bruschi on yesterday, and he mm-hmm. talked about how a lot of teams now, they're going to get off to, we're going to see a lot of teams off to slower starts because of how little time that a lot of the starters get in the preseason. Okay, so maybe you give them a little bit of a pass and say the first week was a bit of an an, an anomaly. Andy Dalton can't be that bad. And then upon seeing this, and I know he struggled primetime Andy Dalton, struggled against this team in particular, but at this stage in his career, Andy Dalton shouldn't be at this point. He shouldn't look like he's regressing. And I don't know if that's something that an offensive coordinator can fix. It wasn't all on him last night, all right? But this – he shouldn't look this bad. You know what an offensive coordinator can't do? Block. You know what yep. an offensive coordinator can't do? Stand and deliver under pressure. Okay, right. so they're lost right now. They're collectively lost, and they're searching for answers. Like Marvin Lewis, the organ- I, to- I mentioned about the organization. Marvin Lewis has never fired a coordinator during the season. So for him to do this tells me that somebody with as much job security as he's had in Cincinnati is searching for answers. And Bill Lazor, good luck. Good luck. In pr- he can't bring the guys you let go back. Right. And what he, can, he also can't do is bring this fr- what seems like a fractured team. I get that they were – Emotional after the game yeah, last based night. based off their comments. With AJ yeah, Green, Drake, Pac-Man Drake Jones. Kirk, Drake Kirkpatrick. You know what it is? Yeah. This, this whole thing is just kind of stale. Yeah. You know, they had so much pressure and so much disappointment that just piled up and piled up over the years in the postseason, and it's stale. And you know what happens after it gets stale? It gets sour. And you know what happens after it gets sour? It stinks. And right about now, offensively especially, they stink. So this seems like the beginning of the end for the Bengals as we've come to know them having never gotten over that playoff. I just wonder how much longer – Andy Dalton is going to be able to hold on to his job. I mean, you have A.J. McCarron right behind him, somebody who's going to be a free agent. At some point, again, Andy Dalton may not be the problem, but if he's not the solution, how do you resist the temptation to go to A.J. McCarron? Just just as you said, much like firing your coordinator so you can get That's something, first fall, a guys. fresh breath of fresh air. All right, Sam Bradford limited for a third straight practice today with a left knee issue. Had an MRI on Tuesday after experiencing swelling, pain, and discomfort after the Saints game. Tore the ACL in that left knee twice. Listed as questionable for Sunday against the Steelers, but seems like the play case Keenum is the backup. This has caused some major concern in Minnesota as far as I'm concerned after the game he had. He's the Alex Smith of the NFC right now. I think we're going to reinvent himself this year with that, with that skill position group, with that offensive line. He's, he's been star-crossed based on the injuries. And I really as many people that killed the Vikings last year for spending another first-round pick on Sam Bradford, to see him even questionable going into Pittsburgh, I'm, I'm pulling for the guy. Right. I'm pulling for him, and it's really, it really bones me up. Well, I, I'm not trying to read too much of it, much into this, and, and I'm, like you, very aware of the injury history, and he is certainly a target for this kind of thing. Um, but I just feel like... For Sam Bradford, maybe this is the year that he puts it all together. I hope so. They describe the Vikings as being cautiously optimistic. Yeah, but Case Keenum and Adam Thielen were also working on the side after practice, whatever that's worth. All right, and now on to what I'm calling the What Gives matchup of the week, Clemson-Louisville. Uh, last week against North Carolina, Lamar Jackson became the second player in FBS history to post a pair of games with at least 300 passing yards and 100 rushing yards. Meanwhile, Clemson's defense had 11 sacks against Auburn. Just one shot of the school record. That leads us to tomorrow night on ABC. What will give Clemson's defense or will Lamar Jackson just be just exhibit even more brilliance? Marty Marr. Speaking of exhibiting brilliance. What's up, Marty? 
Let's welcome in <laughs> Marty Smith, the man on the scene in Louisville. Uh, Marty, a lot of people are looking at this as an opportunity for Lamar Jackson to get the inside track. See what I did there with you at Churchill Downs? What? That was pretty good, Jamal. <laughs> That's why they paid me the big bucks, my man. <laughs> what should we expect out of Lamar <laughs> on Saturday? Total command of the Louisville offense, video game moves, great leaderships and, uh, leadership, and above all else, speed. That young man runs a 4-3-4-40, but when you talk to his teammates and the staff at Louisville, as I did today, that doesn't even begin to tell the story of his speed. They say he has something called next man speed. What is that? That's when someone's chasing him, trying to run him down from behind, or he's trying to outrun the angle from a tackler. He has ninth gear. Forget sixth gear. There's nobody else in college football, his, his teammates tell me, that is that fast. Now, I got to thinking about that, how badly I'd like to get Lamar out on the track just to see from the back just how fast that is. Well, Coach Petrino won't let me get him out on the track this evening, so I thought, hmm, what better place than Churchill Downs, home of the Kentucky Derby, to run my own 40, and we'll compare my time to Lamar's time. So, Steve. Man, that's cool. It doesn't get better than that. All right, now, here we go. Great job, Steve. Mom's proud. All right, look, now, I'm old. I have on a full suit, don't and I don't have on like that NFL Combine Underwear Olympics outfit, all right? So I'm going to give this a ride. I want y'all to make bets on just how fast this is going to be. My man Gary's got how, the clock. How fast you pull a half and Okay. go. <laughs> the winner has been gay. Running in a suit. Look this dude running in a suit. <laughs> Look at Marty. This fool. I swear. Nobody I loves know, Gary. <laughs> Oh, I am flying. <laughs> Guys, what did he five write? 588. 5.88 second 40, baby. Get some of that, America. Yeah, congratulations. You can play me the 600 power offensive lineman. <laughs> I'm coming for your job, John Brinkus. I'm coming for your job. Now, I know we're out here having fun, but the fact of the matter is, if Lamar Jackson is going to beat Clemson tomorrow night, he's going to need that next man speed. One team, baby. This Thank dude you ran guys a 40 and then tagged it at the end. I can't, I'm with you, man. I cannot wait to see him, though, beat Clemson from the pocket. He was great against him last year, yeah. even more improved this year. Thank you, Marty Smith. Go get some water, man. And I'm yeah. glad you didn't have to use the company insurance policy there. <laughs> oh, we'll talk to you later. <laughs> see you, right, I need a massage. Gears. Yeah, right? I need, I need an, an ice IV. bath. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> <laughs> let's switch gears, y'all. From number three versus number 14, we go to the NBA's top 10. All right? We already knew who was included in the number in the top 10 on NBA.com's 2017-18 predictive NBA rankings yesterday. Today we found out the order. Gotta say, rather predictable. Hard to crack those top three. Let's focus on LeBron James, Jamel. How long is it during his 15th season? How long is he gonna have that number one spot on lock? Well, why does it seem like, at least the last three or four years, that there seems to be this, I don't want to call it a groundswell. That might be overstating it, but this desire to see someone in this spot, right? And only for at the end of every season for us to say, okay, but it was LeBron. That was right, the answer. But right. this year, because you notice it started after KD won finals MVP. Yep. This year, it feels like coming into the season, more people are willing to consider the argument that Kevin Durant is, at the very least, right here, neck and neck with LeBron James. Maybe 1A. Right. How long can – here's the thing. Like, so maybe it might be this season. Historic stat line in the finals and defeat, but how long can you be the best player when you have a player of KD's caliber winning a championship or championships? When you're the best player in the game at a certain point, you can't keep finishing runner-up and just be considered the best player well, and, and indefinitely. Consider this. As good as he is, and I do believe there's a second level. I watch those oh. workouts. I do – excuse me, not a second level, a next Another level for level. LeBron James, even at this late stage but in you got to consider this part, too. For the first time in a while, I'm not saying – I don't know if we definitively know whether or not the Cavs are the best team in the East. So here's the thing. What happens – you mentioned finishing runner-up. What if he doesn't even make it to be the runner-up? Yeah. You know no, what I mean? He could not get out of the East. Exactly. And he typically paces himself in the And that might be the, the thing regular season. that takes him out of being, quote, the, the top player. And then you got a guy like Kawhi who, again – the Warriors would have probably won last year anyway. But given how the Spurs look when he was healthy, 
before he got hurt against the Warriors, considered the best two-way guy in the league already. That, another title. You got best play. I love basketball with all the different titles you got. You got player to start a team with. Right. You got player, uh, you know, that you like to build around. Or you got the best two-way player. You got the best player. You got the, the best big man. Yeah, exactly. Kawhi's got the, the two-way best title. all-around player. <laughs> right. He's got the two-way title, a finals MVP on his resume. Is there another level for him to go to? And, of course, as we mentioned, KD, you know, really just getting started with Golden State. But I want to take this opportunity to shout out all the screen grabbers out there, all right, who like to use us for attention. In case you didn't know, these are NBA.com's predictive rankings for next season. For next season. So I just want to run it back from yesterday and throw that up that I had my list from yesterday, my one through ten that I'm predicting this year. There it is, right there. All right, what that number three is I'm saying, and you can, we can run this back at the end of the season, that this season, at the end of this season – Greek Freak will, be will vault into that conversation into the among five. the best handful of players in the NBA. Are you working out with Dirk right now? Yeah. Are you supposed to be working out with yeah. Dirk this summer, work, getting a jumper? Okay, so that's what that means. So, holler at me at the end of the season. I'm not saying that he is number three. Now, do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? <laughs> this is predictive. That's called a bold statement. There you go. Top, Giannis has a top five player. Next year, he All coming. Right. That boy coming. In case you haven't caught on, because we've only done this for like 10 days in a row. This is called Take It or Leave It. All right, Deshaun Watson played all right. 125 passing yards, 67 rushing yards, rushing TD. More importantly, uh, Houston won. So, Mike Golden Jr., who joins us now. Nice jacket. You taking it or leaving it? Have the Texans solved their quarterback problem? I'm going to leave it just because they didn't really allow us to get the answer to that torsion of the test. They just they handcuffed him in this offense too early right now. I'm going to wait and see still. Yeah, I'm going to leave it as well because I don't think this team is constructed or was intended to grow with Deshaun Watson. The idea was Savage is good enough while Watson sits and waits because we got a really good team around him. So I still believe that at the first sign of trouble, Bill O'Brien – is going to go back to Tom Savage. He's going to have rookie mistakes, ups and downs, like they all do. I don't think Tom, I don't think Bill O'Brien is built to endure thick and thin with Deshaun Watson. And plus, somebody's going to stop him from running. That's not going to happen every night. No. Right? Are you just saying that just because Texan, the Texans are expected to be obviously a you playoff team? Got J.J. prime. The expectations the, the, that he has to worry about winning else. games. Exactly. Well, win I disagree now. with both you gentlemen. I'm going to take this. I think that he is their answer. I think Bill O'Brien, if he's smart, he sticks with him. You just live through those ups and downs that naturally come with being a rookie, rookie quarterback. I don't think. I don't think this is the kind of team or setup where you can keep playing revolving quarterbacks. So I think he needs to stay and stick with this decision, given this is what they kind of drafted so him for. Once again, if you were going to do that, he'd have been out there week one. At some point, if you're going to be the quarterback whisperer, you better start whispering. Stick with your guy and build around I think him. he's impatient. All right, so moving on to another interesting NFL matchup. Uh, got the Patriots and Saints. We know what happens to the Patriots in week one. They got drilled. So, Gola Jr., is it panic time? if the Patriots fall to 0 and 2. I'm going to say take, yes. Take I'm, it or leave it, I should say. I am going to take this one. Okay. It is panic time if they fall to 0 and 2, especially if the offense doesn't look better. Because we know this is the New Orleans Saints team that just made us all rethink everything we had ever come up with about <laughs> Sam Bradford. Like fundamentally his existence changed for us after what that Saints defense let him do. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and leave it because I'm already preparing myself after they go to 0-2, if they, go, if they do so if I go already, to 0-2, I have to, have to put it in perspective for everybody and talk people down off the ledge when it comes to the Patriots. I think that defense is going to be a work in progress. Saints at home, not what it used to be. The Dome is not what it used to be. But I think their offense gets right against the Patriots' defense. And 0-2 is not insurmountable for this group. It may, it may totally make us look ridiculous for talking undefeated. But if in offseason, but if they go 0-2, it's still not over for the Patriots. Yeah, I actually agree with you. I'm going to leave this as well because there, there are some elements here in which I could see the Saints winning this game. So it's not like this is a, some kind of gross impossibility. The other part of it, I do think it, it does matter how they lose because if we see some of the same things that we saw from their defense or lack of defense in, in the first game, then I'm going to start to question and wonder is this correctable or is this just who New England is? Yeah. But, see, but seeing how Tom Brady sounded after the game, yeah. 
I just can't imagine that he would let them lose, though. And to Michael's point, this is still the AFC East where the Dolphins came back from an 0-2 hole to make the playoffs last year. So something tells me the Patriots got a decent shot. Yeah, I would agree. All right, moving on. So uh, backing up his stellar season opener against the Patriots, Alex Smith. Well, will he have a repeat performance versus the Eagles? Mike, take her to leave it. Or Mike G. Mike, who, what, Mike G. Which I'm one? sorry, okay, Mike G. Got, okay. got a lot of Mike up on here today. I'm going to leave this one. I think Alex Smith is a darn good quarterback. But again, like Sam Bradford, I'm not going to believe that overnight they all of a sudden just became this completely different guy. Water finds its level, and I think Alex Smith will too. You know what? I'm actually going to leave it as well. But that doesn't mean that he's not going to play well, but just not as well. Yeah. Right. 368, four touchdowns. I mean, that was, that was next level. I think he can still – get his against Philly's defense, but their pass rush is much better than the Patriots. Secondary, Darby being out, they, they, something to be desired for Philly, but their pass rush is going to get after Alex Smith, so I don't think he has his way with them, but I think he still plays well. I do believe this is who he is. I think they, they came into the season wanting to push the ball down the field. I think he's been pushed by Patrick Mahomes. He's going to keep Patrick Mahomes on the bench, and he's got some weapons that's going to continue to make him look even better this year. I'm going to take this, um, and I don't know if the numbers will match, but I think at the end of this game, when the Chiefs win, and I do think they'll win. Um, we're, the story of the game is going to be Alex Smith. I, I, again, I don't know if the numbers will look identical, but I think he's going to be the reason. There's something to be said for some level of resurgence, something that's been ignited in him, and I think some of it has to do with Patrick Mahomes. Now, he said what the other day that he doesn't expect to be in Kansas City next he season. He's going to make that hard. He is, but there's something kind of freeing about that, where he's not tripping about this situation. He's yeah. just like, it is what it is. I know they want this young guy. I'm at peace. I'm comfortable. So I think that's going to allow him to play in this peace of mind that we may see the best of Alex Smith that we've ever seen in his career. So speaking of the quarterbacks, uh, Aaron Rodgers, uh, will he ruin the Falcons home opener, which is already ruined because the Chick-fil-A nuts know they can't get any Chick-fil-A sandwiches tomorrow. But will he ruin uh, the Falcons home opener at their new stadium? Uh, Mike G. Take it yeah, that, that, is, that is pretty messed up, but that's a story for another day uh, on that. I'm going to leave it right here. I think the Packers got some interesting injury concerns potentially on the O-line. And listen, the Falcons at home coming off of that appearance, they're going to look fast on that turf on both sides of the ball. I'm going to leave it too. Uh, I'm worried about whether or not they leave Brian Balaga at home. Just sent him home again with an illness, got an ankle problem. Um, in that new arena, excitement, energy, fans fired up, seeing him for the first time since everybody had 28-3 to jokes. Against a team that they had their way with in the NFC Championship game, that pass rush gets after Aaron Rodgers. Secondary, you know, they can be had in Atlanta, but right. I do think Atlanta ends up winning a shootout behind Matt Ryan continuing the show that last year was not a fluke. I'm actually going to take it. I think uh, the Packers will pull the upset. But it was interesting to me how, because it was so close between the Falcons and the Bears, people almost made it seem like the Falcons lost <laughs> because everybody didn't expect the Bears to be very good this season or just right. mediocre at best. And so, yeah, certainly I think that they'll be uh, inspired to want to play better, and especially being right there at home. But I, I do think Aaron Rodgers is kind of on a mission this season. And even though uh, everything you guys pointed out about some of the things that could not, maybe not possibly go Green Bay's way, I think that he will have his way with their secondary. So I like Green Bay in this one. All right, um, Joe Thomas. This is one of the more unbelievable stats. Uh, stats rather, Four snaps away from 10,000 consecutive snaps. Uh, Thomas' streak. I'm wondering, Mike Gola Jr., is it more impressive than Brett Favre's streak of 321 games? Take it or leave it. It's the easiest take of all time of for me right here. Ten, I, a, little, a little bit <laughs> a of little bias, little bit bias, bias, bias on this one, but forget the abject hell that Joe Thomas has dealt with being a player on the Browns during this historic <laughs> run, but just the things that you have to overcome play in and play out at his position. Right. And to not only play 10,000 straight snaps, but to be the best guy doing right. what you do for every one of those 10,000 thousand snaps the first player to make be a, 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 a pro bowler and for each of his first nine seasons this guy's just different I mean to never leave the field it's one thing to start a game okay quarterbacks aren't getting and I'm not taking anything away from Favre's consecutive streak or the Mannings or anything like that quarterbacks aren't getting hit every play you know you're contacting every play as an offensive lineman yeah. so never so much as leave the field on offense even to your point about the Browns you're getting blown out a lot <laughs> right. in over the years. <laughs> right. And yet the professionalism to stay on the field and still perform like a Hall of Famer is good fortune, but it just speaks to who he is. That's, that's an amazing streak. Probably way more impressive. It, I'm it, taking this. It is, in case you can tell. It, it is an amazing streak, and I don't want to seem like I'm disrespecting it or belittling it or diminishing it. But I'm leaving it because I still think the fact that Brett Favre played that many consecutive games, all right, started that many consecutive games, 
That's just absurd. And I don't mean to fall into the trap of automatically overvaluing everything a quarterback does. I hear like you. I see in your eyes what you think I'm doing. Look how many linemen get their ankles rolled up on from behind. Look, look at that division. He's field. been there that entire time with James Harrison. I got with you. Lamar Terrell Woodley, Suggs. with Terrell Suggs and Elvis Doomerville. Like he's had some dudes in that division coming in. No, he, he has, and what he's done is 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 remarkable and considering his fun personality to be in Cleveland that long and still, you know, not be down on yourself and still be as, as, as open and, and, and as engaging as he is, is, is miraculous. Trust me. But I know the Mannings have, have done it, and Eli's the current uh, active guy with the most consecutive starts. But I guess for quarterbacks, we just see them go down so much. Or get replaced. Or get replaced. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's hard to even just hold on to your job right. for that long, given the pressures that most quarterbacks face. So, right. sorry, I'm with them. appreciate it, man. Okay, keep your eyes closed. Okay. I want to show you my first ever painting. Mm, all right. Okay. Open your eyes. Oh, that's a lot of colors mm-hmm. <laughs> and shades. So be honest. What do you think? Well, uh, I like how if you switch to Geico, you could save hundreds of dollars on car insurance. Oh, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. Here, why don't I hold your paintbrush while you call them? Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. USC and Texas square off for the first time since on Saturday. That was one of the best college. It's one of the best games. Forget college games. It's one of the best games of all time. A lot of people think it's the best college game ever. Texas and USC ranked first and second in the AP poll for that entire season. Of course, Vince Young and the Longhorns won a national title, snapping the Trojans' 34-game winning streaks. So Saturday's matchup, not quite the same luster. Texas, unranked under Tom Herman after that loss to start the season. USC's win streak, only 11 games, not 34, okay? But does feature USC quarterback Sam Darnold. So we now welcome former Longhorns coach, now ESPN analyst, Mac Brown, who's calling Illinois at South Florida, following us right here on ESPN. Uh, coach Brown, before we walk down memory lane, this game, uh, it isn't quite the level to the last meeting, which you know a little bit about, but it does feature another quarterback seen as a potential early First round draft pick in Sam Darnold. What have you seen from Darnold that makes him uh, worthy of such an investment if he were to turn pro? Well, Michael, I love Sam. He's got all the obvious intangibles. He's tall. He can, he's got quick feet. He, he can run and, and avoid the rush. But he's got the it factor. When he, he brought them back in the Rose Bowl to beat Penn State, that gives his coaches and his team so much confidence in him that they know they're never out of a ball game. Now, uh, Coach, Mike and I, we had this off-air argument because we were yeah. talking about Tom Herman because uh, he never lost, he's never lost a game against an AP-ranked opponent as a head coach. Uh, and when he's the underdog, he, t- he tends to excel. Now, even though some of that previous success came when he was an offensive coordinator at Ohio State, it came when he was at Houston, how might that previous success, or maybe it doesn't, I don't want to put words in your mouth, how might that previous success, how might that translate into the matchup with USC? Uh, It translates well because it gives him confidence that they can do it. They can show the players those stats and the staff, and they know they can do it. And if USC, the team that that played against Western Michigan, shows up, they'll have a chance to do it. If the team that shows up against, uh, showed up against Stanford plays, they're probably in trouble. All right, Coach, what do you think about uh, USC listing its record against Texas at 4-0, as it says, as directed by the NCAA? Well, number one, I was there. <laughs> so I, them. I got the ring and I got to keep it. And it was on ABC, so it was a national game, and I think we all saw it. Number two, I looked in the uh, Texas media guide, and we still count it as a win. And I didn't realize that you could get rid of all your losses. If I could have done that, I'd still be coaching and have a wonderful record. So if I, if I could have asked the NCAA to get rid of the losses and let me keep the wins... It would have been a lot happier place for me. Perfectly put. So let's go back to that game. Of course, you came out on the winning side uh, the last time these two teams met. If you had to pick just one moment from that game, I mean, the iconic photo of just Vince Young celebrating and, and, and going into the end zone, what, which moment stands out to you the most from that game? Guys, I think it has to be the, the fourth down and five, last play of the game. There's 20-something seconds left. Vince scores, and I'm so proud of that team that they they didn't celebrate. We had to go for two. We only had a one-point lead. Uh, We we got back uh, in a huddle quickly enough that USC had to burn their last timeout. So I think it's not only Vince Young scoring the last drive 
with uh, 19 seconds left, but it's also the way the team handled the score. They acted like they expected it, and they acted like they wanted to be there. All right, Coach Brown, we will join you at the top of the hour right here on ESPN for Illinois and South Florida. All right, the Canelo Triple G weigh-in didn't have the same fireworks as Mayweather McGregor, just, you know, some polite staring for a really long time. But boxing purists, they don't care about that. They don't need the show. Uh, both fighters weighed in at the middleweight title limit of 160 pounds. Now, if Mayweather McGregor was the spectacle of the year, <laughs> this is definitely the fight of the year. No 19th question. straight title defense for Triple G and Canelo's third fight at middleweight. This gentleman here knows a lot about the fight game. Teddy Atlas joining us now to break it down so it can forever be broke. So, I assume you watch the weigh-in. Well, fixed. <laughs> what, the weigh-in? <laughs> I was like, what, you got some information for us? No. Um, but, Teddy, what did, you, what did you observe? What stood out to you about Canelo and Triple G's weigh-in today? That the uh, smaller guy, Canelo, looked like the bigger guy. Uh, he's been bulking up. I don't know if he's taking supplements. And don't get crazy out there, anyone. I'm not accusing anybody of any. I'm saying supplements, legal supplements that bulk you up a little bit, maybe a weight program, whatever. But this is a guy who's fought at 154, 155. He came in and on the button at 160. He grabbed the electrolytes. He grabbed the Gatorade, whatever they're drinking there. He grabbed all the nutriment that he could. This is a guy who never had to do that before. Now he's doing that. You have six pounds to play with. I was a little surprised, to tell you the truth, as a trainer, look and say the guy that has a margin didn't have a margin. You know, he's acting like the guy who just made the weight, mm. you know? So I was, I was a little, and I'm saying to myself, what does that mean, Teddy? What does that mean to you as a trainer? Well, maybe in trying to be the bigger guy, which you can't. That's up to God, your parents, and genetics. They're born to be that way. Golovkin was born to be the bigger guy. Canelo's not going to become really the bigger guy. He could bulk up in a false way and look like the bigger guy, but then what does he lose? Does he lose the things that the smaller guy brings in to have a chance to win that a smaller okay. guy needs to use to win against a bigger well, guy? Well, that's what I was going to ask you. So, okay, you're talking about what he's done to get to this point. How does he pull off the win? A rare underdog in his last 20 fights. I think it's like the third time he's the underdog. He better start by avoiding this. The right hand of Golovkin, the power punch. Mm -hmm. Because again, he's the biggest, stronger guy. That means he has the power. That means that Canelo has to make sure that the danger zone for me is the first six rounds. Kind of like going through a bad neighborhood. You better not get mugged. <laughs> you know, you better be alert. You better be looking out for things when you're going through that area. Well, that area, six, seven rounds, he better be looking out for a right hand yeah. and make sure that that's not land. That's where it starts for Canelo. Don't get caught with that big power punch by the bigger, stronger guy. And one other thing, this. Don't get caught up in yourself with this weigh-in that you look like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger there, <laughs> you know? And, and, but you're not. Yeah. And, and so now you start acting like him, and you start acting like the bigger guy and fighting with the bigger guy, fire with fire. Right. You might find that you were the smaller guy. I beg your pardon. Second time in his last 20 fights, he enters the ring as an underdog. So, meanwhile, but he is the younger guy by about eight years or so. What's the, how does the age difference factor in this? Big. Uh, on the side that if you're a fan of Canelo, you hope it factors big because I think I've seen deterioration in Golovkin. I really okay. do. Okay. He's 35 years old. I think that he's been deteriorating. He's not the same fight he was when this fight was proposed first, when they started talking about it two years ago. Matter of fact, when they started talking about it two years ago, I went on this network and I said, you know what? If they make this fight right now, Golden Boys people need to be arrested and put in handcuffs for mismanagement because that guy is too small. The other guy is too big and too strong right now. They should wait. Well, guess what? They waited. Yeah. And over the last two years, I've seen a deterioration. Mm. I've seen him become less. Um, I don't know, honestly, if it's the age, if it's the, the fights that's deteriorating, or maybe it's the old curtain being pulled back in the Wizard of Oz and the Wizard's not there. Maybe he was exposed. Maybe Golovkin. Maybe we overrated him. Oh, Teddy, don't, don't tell me Whoa. that. Don't tell me that. So it sounds like you're going with Canelo, but well, wait a second. We, Michael, do you McGregor? understand that this is a guy that we made him into an android. We right. made him into the Terminator. And but he was beaten up on junior middleweights. And I'm not saying he's not going to win the fight. And oh, that he's okay. not the favorite. But I'm just saying he's been beaten up on junior middleweights, middleweights, junior middleweights, European junior middleweights, and junior middleweights 
His resume is full of, of guys that lost at the next level. And now he fought Danny Jacobs in his last fight, a real middleweight. You know, but but not Marvin Hagler, but a real right, middleweight, right, right. okay? Okay. And, and I, I love Danny Jacobs. Yeah. And he struggled with him, struggled immensely with him. So I'm just saying, was the curtain pulled back? Was he exposed? Did we finally see, hey, he's not the Terminator. This is what he is, and this is what he's not. Okay, right, so, so we got to uh, go. I'll say real quick, you got to put it on record, no, though. No, no, no. I, don't need, I just want you to, it's going to live up to the hype, right? Maybe oh, the okay. McGregor exceeded the hype. Yeah. This is the one we've all been waiting for. This is going to live up to the hype. This is right? intrigue. Oh. I don't know if the smaller man trying to be the bigger man is going to stand there and, and try to prove something. All I know is there's going to be fireworks. Okay. That, that I'm so going to tell you. Got, who you got? The easiest, they're telling me to rap, so I'm going to rap real oh! quick. Oh! No, no, but I'm going to wrap it up real quick. On that six, okay. Okay. Seven. It's okay. I know you guys run red lights, right? All the time. I mean, I've been known to run a couple. When first, I was going to pick Golovkin. That's the easy pick for me. The ninth round stop, it's too big, too strong. But I'm going with Canelo. Okay. I'm going to say what I've been seeing, the deterioration, all those things, whether it's the wizard stuff or whether it's age, I'm going to say it's real. Okay. I'm going to say that Golovkin, the younger guy, is going to win. All right. All I know is if it's Not as good Golovkin, as Golovkin, Canelo. Canelo. If it's as good as this analysis, we're going to be great. We'll be fine. Thank you. All right. You know what I love? I love Jake. Jake Cutler slander. I do. I know you do. <laughs> I'm sick of y'all. Uh, so the Chargers. He'd take on the Dolphins on Sunday. Melvin Ingram. He had a great game against the Broncos. He did. And he was asked about Jay Cutler. He said, we don't see him as a problem. All right, man. We're here. Good, yeah, man. <laughs> what? So In other news, make, dude that can make water is wet. <laughs> <laughs> I cracked myself up. They're about to light them up. Okay. Told y'all. Uh-huh. Jay Cutler didn't even practice this all season. He was like, I'm just going to do TV because it's that easy. Came off the couch swinging. TV. I'm telling you, you look good in the preseason. See, you didn't see him last week. Watch Jay Cutler. Got nothing to say next week. Isaiah Thomas sleeps with a basketball. Why is that doing too much? Why is that doing too much? I, I'm not, that is not a little surprising that a grown man sleeps with a basketball. If, if he, even if he is a basketball player. Okay. I'm like, not even going to get into some of the idiosyncrasies I got stuff I sleep with. You do share with the class, Michael. No, I'm sorry. Sure? I, okay. I respect it. Man, man is serious about his craft. Uh, Gabby. Yes. Hey, Gabby. Uh, she, wants to, she, wants, she wants to know when someone is putting out the best butt with the most championship rings list because all these lists have been happening. She didn't say butt. You're talking about D-Wade? Yeah. And the speaking of D-Wade, right oh. no butt shot, but definitely... Full frontal, him and LeBron working out together. Um, you think he? You think that uh, D Wade, LeBron, Gabby, if he had to pick one, <laughs> who's he picking? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Our racing champion, Fabrian Hero, tested positive for traces of cocaine. That's this is all. How is this doing too much? This is awesome. According to the Irish Greyhound Board, although the dog's trainer claims the dog ingested the cocaine. The dog bubbles from the wire? Cocaine is a hell of a drug. <laughs> I mean, like, how does this happen? How does your dog ingest cocaine? I've never had cocaine. Just for the record. For the record. I'm glad that America now knows I have this. a natural. You're cocaine-free. <laughs> but still, your dog. Like, what, what's happening around that area? Huh? Uh, during Billy Joe Saunders and Willie Monroe Jr.'s weigh-in for Saturday's fight, Peep what Saunders' seven-year-old son did. Oh, come on, man. Punched him square in the... Come on, man. You got you to gotta aim high, Willis. You got to... No, he was that. punching down, Mike. Like, that's a purposeful hit. Now, if that... Your son did that to another dude. I smacked the hell out of him. <laughs> Mike, I mean... In public. <laughs> it's okay. And there's somebody to call the authorities. I, I, because Pops looked like he was a little distracted. So he didn't know what happened. But I guarantee you, if he'd have seen... Where do you think he, he learned that? He just snatched him up. I don't. I think he was proud. Okay. Because we, again, that's a reflection of home training. All right. Which I have very little of. Feel good Friday edition. Haven't been this thankful for a Friday in a minute. I have no idea why. Ain't no way in hell Carmelo Anthony is the 64th best player going into this season. We need to start ranking these journalists. I'm here for With them. descriptions of their strengths. No, it goes me. Weaknesses. Me. That's I beat athletic. Chris Johnson in a 40-yard day. With a 900-yard head start. Me. An ability to make up quote-unquote sources. And then sneaking in at number five, yours truly. Pedro, how are the Indians behaving any differently during the streak? We know baseball is a superstitious sport. Great answer. <laughs> Give us more, Pedro. That's the best thing that's been said this entire show. <laughs> Scotty Pippen 
was a star but not a superstar. He's right. No, he's not. Yes, he is. No, he's not. He's not a superstar. Scottie Pippen is not a superstar. <laughs> you, he's not. you are as high maintenance as they come. <laughs> Let's just put it out there. Me, yes. But you know what? You're worth it. <laughs> You're worth it. Ah, that's beautiful, man. I'm not mad at him. That's beautiful. Certainly not lacking any emotions. That's good. <laughs> now you're Jordan and I'm Pippin. <laughs> so that means you're not a superstar? No. <laughs> you had a good day. Congratulations. I know I'm Jordan, okay? I'm just trying to be nice. Let me get this good yeah, day off. Congratulations to Jalen Rose. He'll be inducted into the Michigan Sports Hall of Fame tonight as in the state of Michigan, doing so much in Detroit, including his Leadership Academy. So congratulations, Jalen. Possibly significant football news. Odell Beckham Jr. practiced again today, although limited, responded well to treatment, did more at practice today than yesterday, according to Ben McAdoo. So it's supposed to be like, what, a six-day week injury? Maybe he's back fast in Monday Night Football. Michael Jackson, Tito. We'll be back Monday. <laughs> To preview the game. Y'all have a good weekend, please. <laughs>